So as you might already know, today's guest is Valerie Robertson, um, the publisher and editor of Here's Going Green magazine, um, our local guide to eco-friendly resources. Um, Valerie has a very diverse and wonderful story about how she got involved in sustainability. Um, so before I talk too much about her, if you could just start to enlighten us on your journey through sustainability, that would be perfect. Okay. Um, well, I might, I might just round out what, what the magazine is a little bit first. Um, I, as you, you've mentioned, I'm the founder and owner of Going Green Publications, which I started in order to be able to start an environmental magazine called Cape Fears Going Green. But the umbrella name allows me to start a plant show or a TV show or anything. I tried to make it an umbrella kind of thing so that I wasn't limiting my options in the future when I'm famous and successful. Uh, so the magazine is a quarterly. We uh, feature different themes, different issues, and over the course of a year my attempt is to cover a broad range of sustainability topics. Uh, we are a for-profit company. Uh, many in the community assume we are a not-for-profit because of the spirit of the magazine and the spirit of what we promote. Um, but uh, we have the magazine. We started first issue 2007. Uh, we have an information rich website, although we, we need to uh, get it back up to speed. And in April, we celebrate the 10th anniversary of the environmental book club that we started. So first question, what's my journey in sustainability been like? Um, this, this may be a very long answer, <laughs> uh, partly because I've been out in the world for so long. I, the, the short answer is I had a job for several months or perhaps a year with a solar loving architect in Virginia around 1985 and the rest of my career has been involved in writing, publishing, doing a lot of administrative assistant kind of work and it wasn't until I started this company and this magazine that I returned to my interest in sustainability. So I had a lot of years developing skills and just paying the rent, which you should never discount the ability to pay the rent, um, before I was able to create a hybrid job that allowed me to use all the skills I had been gathering over the years, um, combine that with something that I really cared about rather than something other people thought was important. So, um, I, if, if, if you'll indulge me, I'll, I'll kind of go through what my work history has been. Uh, when I was thinking about what to say, I thought, well, that might be, um, that's not specifically sustainability, but every job you have, every experience you have becomes part of your toolkit for future work future life. I mean, some jobs only prepare you to be a nicer, better citizen. Like in college, I had a job on the dish belt. You know, you take your tray and you put your food on the belt and it goes away. Where does it go? Well, one person's in charge of removing all the small bowls. One person's in charge of removing the glasses. Somebody. So I learned from that experience that stuffing your napkin and your cigarette butts in a glass is really unkind. And so now I'm a better diner. I don't think that helped me career-wise, but my point is every experience you have will probably help you in some way in future life. You just don't know at the time how. Um, I left, I went to Swarthmore College. I studied sociology and anthropology. I was originally a French major, but I, and normally I'm a very 
self-effacing, modest Midwesterner. But for, for the sake of the next hour, I'm going to try to set that aside, and if I have a strength or a skill, I'll just say so instead of saying I like to do something. I'll just say I'm really good at this or I'm not at all good at that because those kinds of thought processes are critical as you pick the career that you're going to love and want to do for a long time. you got to know what you're good at or what you want to learn to become good at. Um, so I went to Swarthmore College. I studied French. I was going to be a French major. And I had learned so much French in high school. I went to a really good high school and had uh, six intensive years of French that by the time I was partway through Swarthmore, um, I had I was taking classes and find literature classes and finding that everyone in the class was reading all these different books for the first time except me. I had done it all. And so I decided I needed to shift to something else so I was continuing to learn more things. Switched to sociology and anthropology but was very interested in sociolinguistics. Um, it, it, it teaches you things like how, how groups of people behave you know, if you have two Spanish speakers next to each other and one speaks a language that is considered more elegant or more refined or more educated than the other, the one of these people will understand the other perfectly well and the other will struggle with that because it's kind of beneath them to understand that type of Spanish. So all, all these things help you learn to work with people throughout life. So that interested me. I didn't really use the French until junior year when my father, a consulting actuary, took a job in Switzerland, moved the family to French-speaking Switzerland where they were assured that everyone in the village spoke English. Well, everyone in the village spoke four languages, but why would they speak English? They have four native languages. Uh, French, Italian, German, and Romanche. Why, why would they need English? So my family asked me to move home to answer the door and answer the phone and go to my sister's PTA meetings and such. So um, it was that experience. I, I was very shy in school. Um, and I was terrorized in, in Switzerland when the phone would ring because I would have to answer it and it might be someone speaking French on the other end, but they could be speaking Italian or something entirely different. And I had to learn to cope with doing all those interactions on behalf of my family of five in another language. That got me a lot more comfortable when, when, when I need to call and find out information in English. That just seems like a cakewalk now. I usually understand the people at the other end of the line, often on the first try. Um, so I left college with this sociology anthropology degree. I was pretty bilingual at the time. Uh, I knew I had learned, I had trained in how to discuss Moliere. Living in Switzerland, I learned how to ask for Coke in Kansas City bottles, or how to buy a rubber hose or um, how to replace a light bulb. Those weren't in my classes at Swarthmore. But I left college with no idea how I was going to earn a living. I didn't have a career in mind. And unfortunately, I severely underused the career planning resources available to me at college. And that was a mistake. Um, and it was primarily because I was so shy I was too shy to walk into the office and admit I didn't know anything about what I wanted to do. So I didn't go. I think I went once. So don't, don't do as I do. <laughs> Please use any resources that you have available, even if you are dubious about doing it for whatever reason. I also didn't really understand 
what an internship was all about. And that too was a mistake because internships are a fabulous way to develop skills or to audition a work environment. Um, it's a way to try out whether you want to work for a for-profit company or a not-for-profit. They have very different fields once you get there. One counseling thing I did early on that I recommend to everybody, even though it costs some money, there is a group called the Johnson O'Connor Research Foundation. Is anybody in the group familiar with them? Johnson O'Connor you know, we all, we all take certain tests throughout your life. You'll, you'll have taken IQ tests or aptitude tests. But the Johnson O'Connor Group offers, it costs a few hundred dollars, but they offer a day and a half of testing. And they developed their tests so that they really get a better, well-rounded opinion of, or data, on what your aptitudes really are. And they maintain, and I agree, that the better you are able to match your aptitudes and interests with how you spend your time, um, the more satisfying your life is going to be. There are some, some things you can be good at and you can substitute a different kind of activity um, and still be pretty fulfilled. The only aptitude that actually has no substitute is music. If you have an aptitude for music and you are not performing or practicing music in any way, that's the one thing for which nothing will substitute. And in this last year, I have actually, due to the pandemic, started singing again because my sister and I on opposite coasts have joined each other's choirs. She's in the Wilmington Community Choir, and I'm helping pre-record music for her church services. And um, that's, that's a, an opportunity that will go away when the pandemic subsides, but it's, it's fun to be doing that again. So Johnson O'Connor um, taught me some really interesting things that have provided very good guidance. Um, and here's where the throwing the modest, uh, taking the modesty and setting it aside momentarily. Um, my sister and I took these tests the same weekend and sat in on each other's results so we can see how we, how we compare. And we're both really good at putting together 3D puzzles. We're good at making things. We're good at building things. We have lots of ideas. There's a, one of the tests is how many ideas do you generate? We test off the charts on ideas. Um, some members of this group have commented that I ask uh, good questions or a lot of questions, or maybe I just talk a lot, um, but that's the aptitude that means that's how I am and that's what I do. Now, one of the things that I learned from that, from that analysis is I am fortunately one of those people who is really good at a lot of different things. And that's a blessing and a problem. The blessing, of course, is it gives me options for what I want to do. Um, it could help explain why it's so hard for me to figure out what to do, because it, it seems I have lots of choices. The career decision that I have been able to make over and over and over again, thanks to this program. I love to make things with my hands. I love to quilt, and I'm putting some links in the uh, chat here, or uh, maybe somebody will put them again for the benefit of anyone who joined us later on. Um, I make museum quality art quilts by hand. I do a lot of things by hand. I love making things with my hand and it would be, it would be, it's tempting because that's so satisfying to say, well, I'm going to be a potter or I'm going to be a professional quilt maker or I'm going to make wedding dresses for a living. All those things would be fun for me. However, people who 
are good at a lot of different things shouldn't do just one thing because it never remains satisfying for very long. I think if I had been born 300 years ago, I might have been a really good uh, violin maker uh, had I been fortunate enough to have been born male, of course. Um, but that kind of artisan craftsmanship attracts me. I'm very good at it. I'm very good with my hands. I, I have a lot of fine dexterity. Don't ask me to play team sports or make a political argument. Um, I can't do those things at all, but I can make things and I enjoy it. But the problem is, after I've made one thing, I don't want to make a hundred of them to sell them. I want to do something different every single time. And I don't know that I'm really an artist. I'm more of a craftsman. So it would, it would not entertain me very long to try to have some thing that I make, that I love to make, and do that over and over and over again. That shouldn't be my job. Similarly, I shouldn't be a research scientist because research scientists will commonly pick a problem, a research problem, and they will do research on that problem for perhaps 20 years. Now that requires a lot of focus, it requires a lot of intelligence, it requires many things, but I'm good at too many things. I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't be a ballerina, not that I have the body type to even entertain the thought, but had I been born looking like a ballerina, that still would be a really bad choice for me because it's a single-minded focus in becoming very intensively good at one thing. And attractive as that is, that's not, not my cup of tea. What they advised me at the time, and this was 40 years ago, they advised me that I should do something like be a, an entrepreneur and build a company where I could be pulling together a lot of different parts. And they said, had it been the 1880s, I should have gotten involved in railroads, started a railroad. But they didn't have any particular thing in mind, but they planted the seed that I shouldn't count on making violins or making quilts or um, uh, some artisan kind of thing being the way I become all I can be. So whenever I've had a fork in the road, I've needed to think in terms of doing something that makes me gather a lot of disparate information and pull it together somehow. So that's just a guiding principle that the Johnson-O'Connor tests introduced for me. Um, my dad told me always that I should just strive to be anything I wanted to be, but this was the 1970s, which is not that far beyond the 1950s, if you think of roles for women in the 1950s. And so when I asked for advice on how I would get started getting a job, all he could think of was, well, a lot of people get a job as a secretary and work their way up. And so that's actually what I wound up doing to find some of my early jobs. Um, my first job, I was living in the D.C. area. I worked for a management corporation where I helped. Uh, it was a four-person company getting ready to, to grow to about a 20-person company. So I helped them collect data in seven states. I started out as the phone answerer as a temp, and then they hired me. And I did the bookkeeping, did the office manager kinds of things. And then they won a big contract with the Bureau of Prisons. And I traveled to federal penitentiaries around the country, gathering medical data, re reading doctor's handwriting in federal prisons for a particular year 
and converting it into the Merck manual codes, those two-digit codes or multiple-digit codes that explain an, an illness or condition, so that we had a database of inmates' use of medical services so they could plan how the Bureau of Prisons was going to allocate their, their money. Um, my next job, I went to work for my dad, who was a consulting actuary, and had been the, so he was a highly specialized mathematician who works with probability and statistics. He was um, the chief actuary of our social security system for a while. And he, the more he worked with it, the more frustrated he got that we weren't really telling the public how it works. So he decided to leave the government, get a high level job where he would be paid to write the book he wanted to write explaining Social Security to the lay public. And because he and I work so well together, um, he hired me to be his assistant. And let's see, I'm not looking at the right view here to see where I show up. There we go. So he wrote a book called Social Security, What Every Taxpayer Should Know. And to begin with, I was the manuscript typist. Uh, this was before computers it were common personal computers. So I had a Xerox 800 dual cassette word processor. This was a step up from the Selectric typewriter where if you had something to change, you would write something that was the same length as the thing you were taking out and you would cut it out and glue it on so you didn't have to retype the page. So this is a 400 page book. Uh, we looked and looked for a publisher that was not going to change his work because actuaries are precise and they don't like for people to change their work. We couldn't find one so we started a publishing company and published it ourselves. So it's a 400 page error-free book. And so that put us in the position of picking the typeface, the design of the book, what paper it's on, what color paper it's on. They tried to convince us to close up the leading so the lines of type were closer together so it would be fewer pages and it would cost less to produce and we said but it would be hard to read so we're not going to do that. We picked things like the headband, that's the little cloth thing at the top and the bottom here that holds it together. All those decisions we were suddenly in a position to have to make because we were going to go rogue and do it ourselves. They, they had said they could publish it in, I don't know, two years time. And we said, uh, this is a timely book. That's not good enough. So we took it from manuscript to this in three months. Because when you work for your family, you work more hours. <laughs> I hired, a, I actually hired a friend of mine from college. Um, and we would double, she and I would double person proofread it. Uh, one would read aloud, complete with punctuation, and the other would find where it didn't match. People who work with me really need to be detail oriented because everything I produce has to be pretty good. And I try to fact check and make things error free. That's not going to be completely the case, but I certainly want to try and I always need allies to do that. I went to an actuarial convention with dad and uh, a couple of actuaries from the Social Security Administration, young men, came up and said, you know, we were hired to discredit your book by finding the mistakes. And there aren't any. And sir, if you'd ever like us to come work for you, we would be honored <laughs> to come work for you. So if you do your best work every time you have a chance, um, it will help you later in life in a way you can't predict. So I worked for Dad for a while. We published a book. Um, I then was ready to do something else. I got a temp job 
with Martin Marietta. It's now Lockheed Martin. Um, they hired me because I read the manual. Uh, when I came on, I was just going to type for um, a managing director, a woman, unusually, a black woman, really unusual, a young black woman, really, really unusual for a defense industry company at the time. And the secretary who gave me the typing jobs said, whatever you do, don't bold any words because once you bold, you can't stop bolding. I thought, well, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> you, you've got to be able to unbold if you bold. So when I had downtime, I read the manual, and sure enough, it's a toggle. You're either bolding or you're not, and it's you know it's left or right, left or right. It's it's not rocket science. So the next thing I typed, I bolded one word. And the managing director comes into my office and said, they told me that couldn't be done. I said, well, I read the manual. She hired me. She created a job for me as a senior technical writer at Lockheed Martin. So I was the English major equivalent in a sea of IT professionals at the IT department and the headquarters of this 70,000 person company. And I was there for five years. So I did, um, I rewrote software manuals. People who can write software sometimes can't explain it to people. They can't tell you. You have to be able to write the manual so your mother understands how to use it. Um, otherwise, no one will use it. Um, and then when I got tired of working in the corporate world, I moved to North Carolina in 1990, and I went out as a freelancer doing um, editorial work and what we called desktop publishing at the time. I don't know that we call it that anymore. I don't know what we call it. Layout. I don't know. Um, and so I had various um, clients. Um, I worked for a while as um, helping a pharmaceutical company doing their pharmaceutical related um, marketing. I did, I, again, I got a job as a temp. I was their administrative assistant. And all the time I was doing this freelance work, including working for the pharmaceutical company, I was working some as a temp for the Star News doing graphic design. I designed the ads for the newspaper. They weren't very good. I'm not very good at graphic design. I make boring ads. Um, but it it was good enough. Uh, in fact, for that crew, if you designed a really good ad and did left justification and did something creative, they would come back and go, we really want it all centered. Okay. And, and there's white space here. We should fill it in. No, you leave the white space so people see the words you left behind. Like, like on your cover graphic here. This is simple, clean, and people are going to read all the words you put on that because it's simple and clean and there's negative space. But they don't want you to do that at the newspaper. So anyway, so I had this whole series of freelance jobs, writing jobs. I got, I got hired to um, edit and proofread the OD Tug journal. That's the Oracle Developers Users Group, Technical Users Group Manual. Uh, so uh, I've just done a lot of varied work hanging out my own shingle, both editorial and layout. It's unusual for someone to do editorial and layout, but I like both. Um, and it's hard to find somebody who does both. Um, so that gave me a little niche that I could fill for people who had canceled their internal newsletter but still needed to produce one. The whole time I was doing all these jobs, I never lost interest in the first sustainability job I had had in the 1980s. And that job was to draw duct work for a solar architect. He was a, an architect who loved solar energy, and he designed heating and cooling systems for residential and small commercial spaces. So, and he worked with an architectural firm that would put the heating and cooling systems in 
historic homes, like Teddy Roosevelt's home. Um, and it's really a challenge to put a heating and cooling system in an existing old building without ruining the building. So that was interesting, but more interesting to me was the passive solar buildings and such that he worked on. And he took me to all these different places and let me look at the construction sites as these places were being built. And I've got a, um, a link here to the Jersey Devils. Uh, one of the many groups we had the joy to, to work with while I was doing this job, the Jersey Devils were four architects who didn't want to follow the career path of going to work for a big architectural firm, being sardined in with other desks. I mean, sometimes they even will put every other desk higher than the other so they can fit more in a room. So you can draw other people's ideas. These four young people didn't want to do that. They went out on their own. They named themselves the Jersey Devils. They built a playground on spec. They sold it to the city. They took the money and they built a bigger playground on spec. And they eventually became this incredible design team. They would live in a Silver Stream trailer on site and build these solar homes. And I was just fascinated by this. Uh, and I put a link out here. Uh, I wanted to put slides that show you pictures, but they're not my images, so I didn't want to uh, 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 run into copyright issues. You know, I always respect other people's work. But if you go out to this, uh, the link I've got here for Jersey Devils, they, the house that I was most enchanted with was the last one that I got to visit. Uh, we irreverently called it the Hoagie House when the owner was not there. He didn't want us to call it the Hoagie House. But this design was seven solar correct collectors in a row with a house built under it. It was a two-story house, and the second floor was not complete. It was sometimes a walkway, and sometimes it was glass block, so that the light would come through the floor down to the ground floor. And if you take the time to go look at the images, this is just, it was a house cantilevered off the side of a wooded hill. It's just gorgeous. So I got to associate with people who would think up ideas like that, and I loved it. But then in around 1985, uh, President Reagan was doing some renovations to the White House, and they, oops, removed Jimmy Carter's solar panels, which had been installed to heat water for the kitchen. And they never put them back. And he got reelected. And a number of us said, you know, we love working in sustainability, but we're not going to be able to pay the rent right now till things, till the world changes a little bit. And so many of us wandered off to do other things. I started doing temp work. I did more publishing work, all the editorial stuff I've already told you about. And I really didn't think a lot about it, although... Looking back, I kept my membership to the American Solar Energy Society. I kept reading about solar energy. Um, there were a number of sustainability themes that were things I read about avocationally because I always get excited about them. So when you figure out something you always get excited about, I mean, it could be cats, it could be anything. Chewing gum, just, well, not chewing gum, it's got plastic in it. Um, but um, just note what you're interested in, because you might not be able to use that in your career today, but maybe you can make it come around again. You may have the chance to have many careers. So I had a magazine. I had a, ch a ch I was between jobs here in Wilmington, and my friends at the Arts Council said, you should bring your quilts in sometime. Let us see your quilts. And by the way, what do you, if you could design your dream job, what would you do? I said, well, I'd combine all my publishing skills. I know how to publish a book. I know how to spell words without spell check. Uh, I type 100 words a minute. Um, I can 
assemble mediocre looking ads. Um, it would be fun to have something that combines the publishing skills and something else I really care about, maybe art. So they connected me with, they had just gotten a fax looking for an editor-in-chief for a magazine they were starting in the Wilmington area called Cape Fear Arts Alive. So I helped design this and uh, for the year that it lived, I was the Wilmington-based member of the Carteret Publishing Company um, office and I published this arts mag, researched and wrote this magazine. It was very popular, it was a lot of fun, but the ad sales were the responsibility of people who lived in Carteret County. And they would come to Wilmington and sell ads unless they had a newspaper emergency. Now, I don't know if you've ever visited a newspaper. Every day has a newspaper emergency in the newspaper world. So we, they really didn't come down to sell ads very often. And they did not, as a result, make it as lucrative as they had hoped it would be. And even though I came up with a whole plan for how we could cut costs and do things differently, my mother was even selling ads. We, we, we were really trying to make this work because it was, it was fun to do and people seemed to like it. Um, but they pulled the plug on it when we were just on the verge of being sustainable. Um, so I was really sad about that. I did a little more freelance. That's probably when I started doing more work for the Star News again. And then I realized that everywhere I walked around in the um, neighborhood, people were asking me questions about where to buy a rain barrel, questions about solar energy, uh, how to buy a tankless water heater. And I always knew the answer, or I knew the person who knew the answer. And this happened every single day. And I thought, this is a sea change. People want this information and they're not finding it anywhere. So I decided to start a magazine. And I never would have dared do that, except I'd already done it once. I knew how to do a magazine of this scale for a three county area, printing, I don't know, up to 10,000 copies. Um, knew how to do the layout knew whether I could do it monthly or if I really didn't have time, if I had to do it quarterly or every other month. Um, so I had that experience and I switched it over and I started the sustainability magazine. And all this avocational reading that I had been doing was helpful. And, and I would go to meetings like the Cape Fear Green Building Alliance was a local place you could gather information about um, renovating your house or building a house in a more green fashion. And I went just for fun. So when I started the magazine, I already knew architects and builders in Wilmington who were doing this. So the, what was your original question? What has your journey in sustainability been like? It's been convoluted. And it really looked like a publishing career for the longest time. But now I've been able to make a hybrid product and service combining the sustainability that's always fascinated me and all these publishing skills that I have developed along the way. So it, it was clear to me people wanted to know more about options that could save money, contribute to more healthful living for their family, and be kinder to the planet at the same time. But there was no central information source. And as I was researching and thinking about starting this, I thought, I'm so methodical, someone is going to beat me to the punch. This is such an obvious need. But no one else did. So I started it. And people have started similar kinds of things subsequently, but they, um, they don't have the publishing background, so they will... Blow the, they'll blow the wad on the first issue. The first issue will be full color and 60 pages and so forth. And um, they, they print an issue or two and then they're never heard from again. You have to start smaller and build, build some momentum. So now I've got this product that allows me to think about, read about, 
and help people with sustainability ideas every day. That's what I work on every day. So there you go. A longer answer than you dreamed possible for that question. Well, that was an awesome answer. And you honestly touched on so many of the questions we would have asked anyways. Um, and I know that after hearing that, people are probably very intrigued on ways to get more involved with the magazine or resources that the magazine has available. Um, so would you would you want to elaborate on that or stories about people that have? So, although you've asked a couple of really good questions, I'd like to touch upon more briefly than what I've just um, told you. Yeah, uh, sure. What skills have I learned from school classes? Um, that I use most, uh, learning how to learn and learning how to write clearly. Those are the two. And then you had a question after that. What have I needed I didn't learn in class? Um, I thought of four things three that apply to what I'm doing now. I, I didn't learn to manage a team instead of working solo. I didn't learn anything about creating and running a business. I never took any business classes or anything. And I, I didn't really develop any computer skills, although in my defense, it hadn't, the computer as we know it had not been invented. I, I believed in learning languages and I learned a, I took a computer class to learn Fortran. I didn't think I would ever need Fortran, but I thought I should learn how to learn a computer language because I might need one someday. And, and then I wind up, you know, I work on a computer all day. <laughs> so I, I knew that I was going to need the skill when it evolved. Um, but I couldn't do it at the time. Um, but managing a team, it's interesting, as a high school student, I costumed plays. Again, I don't make one dress. I costumed the whole production. And, and I managed people pretty naturally because I would, if a seventh grader came in and wanted to work on the play, I would find out which junior guy she thought was just the best looking and assign her the task of making his costume. And I didn't have to worry about her getting it done. I didn't have to worry about it being her best effort. She did it. So I think I've got a little latent management skill, but um, the times I have managed people in the interim, they've been people that I did not hire and would not have hired because they weren't very detail oriented and then I couldn't get my work done um, using their skills. Um, so, so how people can get involved. Um, let's see, let me see if I can share screen. I offer unpaid internships. A lot of people write for me as a volunteer. A lot of people just contribute one photograph. I may find a photograph on the birding group and say, John, would you let me publish your photo on the cover? It's really good. Um, so let's see if I can share screen. I want to advance share screen so I can share a portion of it. I don't know if that worked. I don't think it did. the blue button and then move things around. Okay, if you do this right, you set it up ahead of time. It's a good skill for me to develop. Okay, so here's my high level org chart. And the main product that got me started was the print magazine. And the online presence that also has copies of the magazine is tied to that. But the online presence has a lot of information like um, local links to find local groups, groups you might join uh, or volunteer or intern with, intern with anyone you 
you find interesting, um, calendar of events. I have an environmental book club. I do, um, people ask me to be on their boards, and so I help plan Earth Day. I help plan the Native Plant Festival. Audubon keeps telling people I'm a board member, even though I've never agreed to do it. And they call me with questions. Uh, and community outreach is anything from this kind of event to 10 to 14, in a regular non-pandemic year, 10 to 14 um, events, exhibitor events, where I talk about the magazine and I try to pair people up with organizations that might give them a hobby they want to pursue or a job they might want to seek. And here's the full list of what I do. And when an intern wants to work with me, this kind of appalls the professors sometimes, but one of my first questions is, well, what is it you already know how to do? Because a good internship would let you exercise what you already knew how to do in a new context, but also allow you to stretch and do something you're kind of afraid of doing to find out if you can get better at it or if you never want to have to do it again, whether that's public speaking or working with people on a um, exhibitor table. So I might have somebody who's really good at science writing and they're very shy and they'll research and write an article for me, but they will also come to man the exhibitor table and be forced to interact with the public and ask their questions and such. So I try to work with people and, um, whoops, um, see what people, yeah, see, see, see what the overlap is. I always need people to research and write, um, Articles, I need photographs, I need people who can do graphic design for ads or for other things. Um, I need people who can help populate the website. I need uh, social media help. I need, um, I'd love to start a neighborhood program, but until I can share some of my workload with people who want to help me, uh, I don't have time to do that. But that would be a cool project to work on. Or someone could come on board with me and they could set up the neighborhood program and I'll keep doing what I do. So there are so many different kinds of work that I do that it's hard for me to say, I'm looking for a business person or I'm looking for a web developer. Yeah, I've got 27 jobs here. And anybody who comes on board and is able to do one of these things um, I'm happy to talk to them and 